yeah, God is good. Just let me know when it's on. Good. Welcome those that are watching us live and Facebook. Welcome to Training the Trainers. And tonight's teaching is Breaking Through and Tearing Down Strongholds of Shame, Fear, and Control. Okay, it's something that we all struggle with. And uh, as I'm doing this teaching, it, it keeps talking to me. I've taught this many times. It's revolved. It's gone. It's in, it, it keeps enhancing, enhancing, because it keeps revealing and revealing. Right? How many know that God is a God that reveals? Yeah. He wants to reveal his heart to his children. And many of us are stuck in that place of shame. So we're going to talk about what is a stronghold. That's kind of like a review that we're going to do regarding the stronghold. But I did talk about that a few months ago. So we just want to kind of dig in just to review what a stronghold, how a spiritual stronghold is uh, built in our life. So it says it often starts with wounds that we experience, a hurt or a disappointment that makes our heart fertile ground for seeds of lies to be planted. Okay? So how many know that the enemy loves to put seeds of lies? Right? And that's how it starts, Okay. On, on the foundation, the enemy then begins to build brick by brick wall of lies and inaccurate ideas about a person, person of God, erroneous interpretation of scriptures, prideful thoughts, and distorted perception in how God sees us or how we feel about with, within us and our sin. You know, we all sin. We all, you know, um, make mistakes. And so that's why we're here, Right? That's why you came Friday, to learn and to discover areas that we probably have never learned and we don't even know. We're not even aware. So when we buy into these lies or agree with the enemy, thereby yielding control, the areas of our lives, becomes a stronghold. Do you know what a stronghold is? Like in the physical, the wars, when they used to protect the enemy, used to, to protect the enemy. Well, the Lord is also our stronghold. That's a healthy stronghold. But the enemy also likes to create strongholds in our lives. And it starts with a seed. And so it says, um, so when we buy into these lies with the enemy, thereby yielding control. So every time we believe in a lie, we yield control to the enemy. All right? You see, we give power to the enemy. It's us that's giving him the power. Amen? Okay? So everything was bought on the cross for you and I to be free. But the strongholds of the enemy comes and he's very subtle. He comes in with these little lies. He navigates through those lies. And as we believe a lie, it becomes a truth. Okay? So it says, which the enemy vigorously defends and retra retains control. He likes to hold on to something that we've given authority. God has given us authority. Amen? We have authority. And sometimes we have passed that authority to the enemy, and he has the control. So it's so important that we have to break through those strongholds in our lives because otherwise we're stuck and we will not grow so it's so important amen, amen. okay so one of the things that the enemy uses okay he uses fear the spirit of fear rejections abandonment so that is the fruit of the, the seed of fear that comes in our lives how many of us battle with fear right we can all say yeah we all do right and the words <laughs> <laughs> and so if we, we're battling with fear, that means we haven't been perfected in his love, right? Because love says cast out what? All fear. All fear. Doesn't say little fear. It doesn't say half of the fear. It says perfect, right? Which is we're coming into maturity. When it says perfect is we're coming into that full maturity. How many know that we still have to mature? <laughs> we all do. We're on a journey to mature, man. So that's what he uses. He uses those words. He also says that we're rooted and grounded in his love. Amen? It says, above all things, it says, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. That's powerful. Like, that's why it's so important to read the word and allow the word to be a reality in your heart. Because the problem is we read it and we just say, well, I just did my duty. The word, this, the word of God is not just mere words. It's spiritual. It takes you in. It takes you to places. It brings healing. It brings deliverance. It comes alive. I mean, every time I read it, I'm just like, wow, how many times have I read this passage over and over and over again? 
And I'm just like getting it now after what, 20 plus years? Yeah. Right? Isn't that true? So we need to know that above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Who is the perfect one? Jesus is the perfect one. And so as we put on love, we're putting on Christ, right? And the enemy likes to also put himself on us, okay? And that's where we don't want to go. So we are rooted and grounded in his love, you know, and we cannot allow, we cannot allow those strongholds to come in. It's an open door for him, an invitation that we give to the enemy to come and to come to distort the way we think, okay? And so it's so important that we should be always grounded in his love because if we're not grounded in his love, we're grounded in fear. And that is the territory of the enemy. So let's be rooted in him. And so we know that rejection and abandonment and shame and security comes to entangle within, within us as like a bond of fear. So there's the bond of perfection and the enemy also is bond, it bond, binds us in fear. And so it's so important to understand that he wants us to walk in that wholeness. Amen? What's something whole? That something is fully, that's complete, right? It's in completeness. So it's so important to understand that. Okay, so our two strongholds that bring bondage to our lives. First is unconfessed sin, okay? So we know that unconfessed, unconfessed sin, we know, we know what Jesus did on the cross. We know, we know, we know, we know. But the thing is, do we know the price that he paid? And as we know the price that he paid, you know, nothing is hidden before him. He knows all things. And, that, and what the enemy does when we miss the mark, guilt comes. And shame comes in our lives. And that is the territory of the enemy that comes to bring that, that garment over us. And so it's, so it's so important to understand that there's nothing hidden before the Lord. He is light. And the enemy is darkness. And as, as we come closer to the light, things will be exposed. But it's beneficial because it brings light to our soul. It brings us closer to him. Sin, takes it, it, it's a wall. It's a, it's a closed door to our relationship with the Lord. So it's so important that the enemy of our soul thrives through secrecy and will establish a stronghold if it's unexposed sin in our life. So if, we're, if we are thinking that he doesn't see, he sees all things. I remember my mom used to say to me when I was little, and you know, we, my mom always installed in me values, didn't know a lot of things about the Lord, but you know, she, we were in the Catholic faith. And one thing she always said to me, God is watching you. <laughs> I'm not watching you, but God is watching. You know, maybe that was a, a, not a godly thing to say in the sense because it brought fear. It made me see God as like, he's ready to hit me over the head, right? <laughs> because that's not the father, right? That's not the father that I know now. Yeah. But that kept me grounded. Because it's like, oh, okay. Because there was the fear. Even though I was, a, I was young, I still kind of like, okay, he's watching me. I got to be careful what I do. So there was some sort of there, something good that helped me to navigate. And as I grew and as I learned and, and as I, I grew in the Lord, now I know the Father. And, and, I don't, and every time I mess up, I immediately humble myself. I repent. That's what it is. It's humbling yourself. It's surrendering your life to him and say, I, I missed the mark. But if I just go and continue doing it, you, it's going to mess me up in my relationship. See, we say, well, God is far away. No, he's right there. He's always there. We're the ones that are far away. We're the ones that make the decision to not be near to him. He says, draw near to me, draw near to me and I'll, be, I'll draw near to you. So and there, there's, there's, the, there's an invitation. He always... He's always inviting his children to come. It's always invitation. He, he is not a controlling God. He's not. He's, it's always through invitation. And that is the beauty of knowing him. So it's so important to confess our sins. It's important to come, to come into that realization that, you know, that I no longer live, but he, Christ lives in me. And as he lives in me, as I get to know him more and more, sin will not have no part of me anymore. It will have no part of me, you know. There's one thing is knowing about God, and one thing is knowing him. It's a huge difference. Knowing about God is about stories, okay? But knowing him, knowing him is through relationship. 
And as you have a relationship with him, you enter in into that place that you are safe, we are secure. But as I don't, if I don't know that a part of, my, of the Lord, then I am going to walk in insecurity and shame and fear and all those things. He wants us to walk with that assurance. Amen? That is so important. Okay, unforgiveness. How many of us still are walking and nursing bitterness against the person or someone? You know, the enemy will take advantage of that to keep you bondage. The people who are wounded you, you know, they might not deserve your forgiveness, but forgiveness is a choice, it's a decision. And as he forgave us, because you know that he forgave us, right? For all our sins. You know, it's just an amazing uh, demonstration of his love at the end on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And so when we have that revelation and that understanding of what he did, that's why he says, forgive. If you don't forgive, I can't forgive you. So how many of us have been forgiven? A lot, a lot, right? So we cannot, we cannot allow bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness to be there because that will create a stronghold in our mind. It will, kept, it will keep us captive in that place and it will not allow us to grow more in him. So we want to be free from all bondage of bitterness and resentment, right? We talk a lot about that, don't we? You know, about forgiveness. Because it's every day, it's a challenge. Every day, you're going to get offended. And let me tell you, the offense is put there for you to grow. Jesus said, <laughs> Jesus said, it's impossible for the offense not to come. In other ones, let me tell you something, church. If you get offended, welcome to community. Okay? If you get offended, that's where you're going to grow. Because it's going to come. It's going to test you. It's going to test your foundation. It's going to test your maturity. And what you do with it is going to be the result. So either you get offended and you isolate, and that is the territory of the enemy, or you choose to forgive just like Jesus did at the end. Just visualize that. Visualize where he was on that cross, all broken, all like he was just in pieces for you and me. For him to say, forgive them, Father. Wow. What a, what a statement. Not only a statement, but that was life-giving. And that's we, we need to say the same thing. When somebody offends you, you say, Lord, I forgive them. And it, and it hurts because it does bring pain. And it does bring, I don't minimize that. But the Lord tells us, forgive and you shall be forgiven. And if we don't forgive, we're going to be given to the what? To the tormentors. Because unforgiveness is tormenting. It's a place where you go in jail and you're with the tormentor, the person that uh, you're, you're holding a fence with. Can you imagine being in jail with the actual person? I don't think so, right? So you want to be free and you want to even free that person. But it's not your responsibility of that person. You're responsible for you. Because the salvation is an individual thing. It's not a group thing. Okay? It's not like we're all going to go to, you know, it's an individual thing. Because we will be judged according to the things that we have done. So we, we want to forgive, 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 and release. Because it's so important. 70 times 70, right? That's like every day. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about shame, fear, and control, okay? So we want to talk about shame, fear, and control in our lives. Some of us are functioning in this area, but I want to establish uh, the foundation of what the Word says about shame and where we are, okay? And uh, Isaiah 61, 6, 7, it says, And you will be called priests of the Lord. Amen? You will be named ministers of God. You will feed all the wealth of the nation and your riches Sorry, and their riches you will be both. So in other words, God has called us to be priests. What is a priest? We are called to lead. We are called to lead. We're, we're called ministers of reconciliation. And it is a beauty. And we're sons and daughters. So it's so important to understand that as sons and daughters, we have an inheritance, right? The Lord says he'll give us the nations and the riches. We should be, li we should be the most richest people in the world. And I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about joy. Yeah. I'm talking yeah. about, 
you know, being the most happy peop the happiest people on the earth, but sometimes we're all gloomy and doomy. Right? Because we're so focused on the things that we don't have instead of being thankful of the things that we do have. Okay? And let me tell you something. When you're focused on what you don't have, that's tormenting. And that's where the enemy comes and brings guilt and shame. Because it says, see, you're a Christian. You don't have this. You don't have that. It's not about the having. I have it all. I have Christ. That's all I need. Everything else is secondary. That is the biggest treasure that you can have. You know, because that is what he is. And that's what we want to represent in our lives. Amen? Yeah. Okay. So in Isaiah 61 says, Instead of shame, my people will receive a double portion. Instead of disgrace, they will rejoice in their inheritance. So they will inherit a double portion of the land, of their land, and um, everlasting joy will be there. So can you imagine? That's where we need to be in that everlasting joy. And that place of understanding. See, when we know him, regardless of the chaos of the world, we need to shut that down. Because the, the enemy is part of, uh, about chaos, but the Lord is about peace. And we should be the most joyful people. People are going to say, like, why are you so happy? And I said, because I have something that's greater than what you have. And that's when you share. Okay. Because people are going to be drawn to us to see what is it that you have that I need. That's, what we're, that's where we're going right now. It's going to be more than just words. You can read the Bible to them from A to Z. It's our, our testimony that is going to uh, draw, uh, draw attraction to them and say, I want that. I want that joy because I am not in joy right now. But sometimes we don't act that way. Sometimes we're, <laughs> we're the opposite. We're always doomy and gloomy, and we don't want to do that. Okay, 1 Peter 2, 4, 7, it says, As we come to him as what? As living stones. Rejected by man, but chosen by God. Precious. We're precious to him. Do you know that you're precious to him? You are precious to him. You are, you're like living stones are being, and I love this part, and being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Offering spiritual uh, sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You know, that's who we are. God is building us. That's why we're here. He's building us. We're building and building. But the enemy likes to build too. He likes to build strongholds. He likes to build walls. He likes to build lies in our lives. And so what, do you want, what the Lord wants to do is build a place that is holy, a place that is acceptable towards, towards God. And that is so important. And the scripture says, and I'm going to continue on Peter, it says, See, I lay the stone in Zion and chosen and precious cornerstone. Who is that? Jesus is the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Where is your trust? Where is your trust? Is it your trust in Jesus Christ? And it says, now to you who believe, the stone is precious. But those who do not believe, the stone of the builders rejected have become a capstone. So in other words, when you don't believe and you don't trust, there's, you're, you lose the flow. There's no, there's, no, there's no nothing there coming back and forth with him because we don't believe. Belief or unbelief is a huge stronghold that many times we battle with. And the Lord wants to break that. He wants to break that, that stronghold in our lives. And it's so important to receive that breakthrough. Okay, so what is, what is shame? We're going to do a definition here. Shame is the sense of being uniquely and hopelessly flawed. Okay? Next is to leave a person feeling different and less valuable than other human beings. How do you feel? Do you feel valued? Do you feel worthy? You know, when I was uh, asking the Lord the other day, I was here on Monday, and I asked the Lord, what is it that you want? Because I always ask her, what is it that you want to speak? And I know Justin talked about shame on Sunday, how the Lord revealed to him about shame and, and that the Lord started healing in his heart. And then on Monday when I came, I go, what, what, is it, what is the need of the people? Because I won't just, you know, teach whatever. It's what the Lord wants us to. And he said, you need to teach on shame. My people are in bondage with shame. And he wants to break that shame in our lives. And many times we feel less. How many feel less than valuable? And that is something that we can say here, I, I am valuable, but in our heart, in our action, in our behavior, tells us something totally different. You know, we can say, yeah, 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 but here we're saying something else, right? I always say that 
Your mind and your heart they need to engage in order to be one. Sometimes we can have a head relationship with God, right? And God wants us to have a relationship, the head and heart together, engaging. So that's, why, that's where transformation begins. That's where it starts in our lives. So it's so important. So, what is, so shame is self-oriented. There is something wrong with me, okay? So it's about how I feel about myself. That is shame. Now guilt... Guilt is knowing that we have done something wrong, okay? That's guilt. It tells us that we made a mistake. Guilt is an action-oriented. So, in other words, I did something wrong. So the other one, shame is self-oriented, and the, and the, and the guilt is action-oriented. So we need to know the difference between the two. And we struggle with the two. We struggle with the two, and, and as they combine the both of them, that's where we are walking in a stronghold of lies, okay? A stronghold of lies. False shame always comes from darkness. It is a sense of being hopelessly flawed and totally inadequate. How many times you felt you'll feel inadequate? And don't put your hands up. It's okay. How many times do you feel inadequate? This person feels there's a need to hide himself. Him, it, there's a need to hide. That's one of the things of inadequacy from others. No one will find out what he or she really feels like. Shame is self-oriented. It is not that it's made a mistake, that there's something wrong with me. I am a mistake. It is a dangerous and painful, unfortunately, common place to be. So when we say, I am a mistake, you know, we're saying to God, you made a mistake. Okay? He doesn't make mistakes. Everything that he does, he does with perfection. We are his masterpiece, amen? But that's the problem. We don't feel that way. And, and that's where our heart doesn't receive. And, and the issue is, is we have a hard time receiving because we don't feel that we are valued and we don't feel that we're worthy, Right? And so we have a hard time receiving. And he wants us to, to learn to receive from him as children. It's so important. This is power. Shame seeks to keep us from living faith-filled life God has planned for us. Amen? Instead of living out our potential, shame cloaks us in regret, insecurity, and in doubt. What is a cloak? Is a garment. Okay? wants to put a garment of shame in our lives and what it does it aborts all our our potential and destiny that he has for our lives so it's so important that we cannot allow the enemy to cloak us with his garments okay we cannot it is not the place what god has called us to be we are sons and daughters when we talked about sonship and daughtership we talked about the importance to know your position your position as daughters and sons we're no longer orphans. We have a father. Isn't that the beauty? We have a father. And that is our position. And as we have that position, if we, once we get that healed and understood in our hearts, the foundation, then we start building. But if the foundation is cracked and it's full of strongholds and it's full of lies and brick by brick and all these things and shame and feel and guilt and all this stuff, we're in bondage. And that's where the enemy wants us. And that is not the place that he wants us. That's not the place the Lord wants us to be. So always remember that God has a plan. He has a good plan. A plan that is perfect. A plan that he loves us. And knowing his love and experiencing his love is so important. Because that is what's going to bring inside of us a change and a transformation in our hearts. Okay. So let's go through this. Shame. Shame says, I'm a mistake, I'm flawed, I'm bad, I'm ashamed, okay, and I, I am defective. Anybody identify with some of these things? Okay, we got to get rid of that because that's not true. Okay, fear. Fear says, okay, what if they find out they will not like me, they will reject me? See, what happens is that when we have shame operating in our lives, it's like a mask, okay? 
It's a mask that we put. Everything's good. I'm all in control. I'm all in control. That's the third one, right? All good, because you know what? I don't want them really finding out who I am, because then they're not going to like me. You know? And so what I have to do, I have to please people. I got to please the people so they can like me. And that is not the will of the Lord. You're only to please him and not to please man. And as you please him, the love that he gives you, you're going to be able to love others. That is the beauty. So, you know, he didn't reject us. He loved us. Amen? Okay. The next one is control. I'll control everything that, that, so that they won't find out what I am or I really like, so I will not get hurt or suffer pain. So we hide behind a mask, right? And we say, well, you know what? I don't want nobody knowing. And so I need to be not ask any questions. Have you ever been in class, you know, when we were in high school? I'm going to take us back to those days. It's happened to me um, when the teacher said, do you understand everything that I just said? And, and nobody wanted to ask a question because we're going to feel really dumb. Yeah. Remember? That's shame. Because we thought, we think there's, there's never a wrong question. And that was liberating for me personally because I always thought that I had to know everything right. Okay? And so because I didn't know everything, I just never asked questions. I was always quiet. I always was shame, fear, and control. I was in my little shell. And so, but one day I said, no, I can ask questions. I'm not going to look dumb. There's nothing wrong asking questions. But we've done that at school. And we feel, and then we never learn right. Because then we, uh, you don't ask the teacher, how are you going to know? And I remember when I was in high school, I started asking my teacher, I don't understand this. I don't understand that. It was liberating for me. And as I ask, I learn. But sometimes we're in that shell of shame and fear and control. Okay. So, Genesis 3.10. We all know what happened at the beginning. Adam and Eve, remember? And uh, when they were instructed not to eat that tree, right? And as, we, as they disobeyed, um, things happened. They were cloaked in the glory. Did you know that? They had, they had a, 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 a dressing was with the glory of the Lord. And as they sinned, that was taken away. And as soon as they realized when they saw each other, what happened? Shame, fear, and control took place in their, in their lives. And what happened is they, they, started, they hid themselves, so they covered themselves. That's shame. They hid, right? That's fear, right? And they didn't want to, didn't want to know anywhere where they were, so they, 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 were, they were hiding. See, but the Lord knew everything. And the Lord asked them, where are you, Adam? Now, he wasn't asking him. The Lord was merciful, and his mercies are new every day. But they didn't because they chose, they chose to. I was naked. They were naked. They saw each other's nakedness. And what came? Shame. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. That's how they hid, right? And then what happened? They were afraid. Okay? They were afraid of who? Afraid of, of God. And then the second is that they hid. They hid themselves. And so that's why this is a cycle. This is a cycle that goes back and forth. And many times we can probably, um, you know, see ourselves in those areas where we hide, right? Where we hide. We don't want no one to see who we really are because, you know, what if they judge me? What if they criticize me? You know what? I had to overcome all that stuff. You don't understand the stuff that I had to overcome. I'm here by the grace of God. I'm in front of you because it's him. Because if you would have known me, well, Enrique knows me very, well, for a long time. He knows me for, what, 25, 26 years? Okay, he's been with us, Chris, our children and the Lord. And so they saw I was always hiding, hiding behind my kids. I was never at the front in the church. I was always at the back until a prophet called me and says, you're supposed to be here, the Lord says. And I'm like, who are you talking to? <laughs> talking to me? Talking to me? <laughs> you know, and so I had to kind of, the Lord had to take me to a place of a lot of shame and fear. I was the most fearful person. I'm telling you, I couldn't be in front of people. I felt every, and I, I've shared this many times, but I know there's a lot of new people here. 
I could not be in front of people. I could not preach. I could not teach. I can do nothing. I would be like paralyzed until my husband pushed me. He says, you're going to do it. I agonized the first day I had to share. I said, Lord, take me now. Like I was at that point where Lord, like, take me. I was struggling. It was two weeks. And you know, when you know something, if you know it like the day before or whatever, you have no choice, right? But it was two weeks notice. So it was like, oh, oh, I have to be in front of all these people. And oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And I just struggling. But you know, the Lord was healing me from that, from shame, fear, and control. He was healing me. I was hiding. I was hiding. And he wanted more from me. And uh, the only way to me to get out of that shell is he pushed me out of that place of comfort. He pushed me out of that place of fear. And I remember that day that I preached for the first time. It was about maybe 100 people or so. And I got up there and I, I literally saw how the Lord took the cloak of shame. And he put me the cloak of, of acceptance and love and the calling room. And, I, and it was like, wow, this is not me. Like, I, I understood it was not my effort. It was him. It was him. So I really encourage you, those that are struggling with fear, to step out. The only way to confront fear is stepping out. You know, if you don't step out, if you don't confront fear, it will confront you. So the only, like, you have to do it afraid. And many times I had to do it. And then at one point I was up, I was up 500 people and then up to 1,000 people. And then one day up to 5,000. I was in South and South Central America in these big churches. And I, and I felt there was this confidence, but it wasn't my self-confidence. It was the confidence of the Lord, knowing that he had called me. Okay? And it was, it was a process. It was a process. And that is the beauty when we know, know him versus knowing about him. Knowing about them in our heads. Mm -hmm. Know all the stories. You know, there's a lot of stories in the Bible. The Bible's not about stories. It's not about stories. It's about a kingdom. Okay? And, and it's life. And it's life that he wants to give us. Okay, so this is what it looks like when we have this stuff, okay? It's true identity is right here, okay? And the rest is a cloak that comes around us and it binds us. It bounds us not being the truth true person that we are and God wants us to get out of that place of fear and control and shame he wants to take he wants us to break through and I just want you to visualize yourself in that place of freedom and as we progress and as we grow you see how it's detaching itself this is not just the one thing this is a process this is not I can't give you no magic potion or anything that it's between you and the Lord it's between you going through stuff that is sometimes hard, sometimes it's challenging, but I tell you, it will bring growth and it will bring change, okay? And as you're free, as you get more free and more free, and it's just detaching and to the point, to the point it gets less and less. And you know, and this is the place where he wants you, total freedom. He wants us to be whole, whole, no, no lack in our lives and many of us are lacking and so we need to understand that true identity is the heart of the father he wants us to have that true identity you know we live in the facade we live in in a mask and and this is what we were taught maybe when we were little children you know we probably it all started from when we were kids you know whoever brought us into this world you know all those things come and if we didn't have perfect parents which no one does Okay, no one does, I don't care. There's nobody on this planet that's a perfect parent. And we're not perfect parents. We have, we have issues, <laughs> you know, and we grow and we mature. And, um, but we take those things with us as children into as when we become adult, you know. And so that's why it's so important that there's two things that the enemy uses many times in our lives. And this is what it is, abandonment. Okay? These are groupings, okay? And so what are these groupings? Well, abandonment. What's abandonment? Well, many, many probably, no, there was never a, a parent present. I mean, you can have parents. You can have father and mother physically there, but emotionally detached, you know? Parents that were provided for you, gave you everything that you need physically, but emotionally detached. And that is a sense of, that's a sense of abandonment. 
for a child. Let's just look at that when we were children. You know, everybody uh, had different upbringings here. And so when abandonment appears in our lives, always the three, group, the, the three there, the groupings are there, shame, fear, and control. So abandonment comes out to rejection. It births rejection and rebellion, okay? And then it interacts with fear and also with being a victim and passivity, okay? And so if you look at fear and shame, they're always nurturing each other with control. It's a cycle, okay? And fear, there's anger and violence, okay? And then there's the control also that, dem that manifests anger and violence. And so when we see control, which is occult, and when I talk about occult, I'm talking about witchcraft, and witchcraft, that's what control is. That's what it says in the Bible, that when, when there's a control, uh, uh, we're trying to control somebody's will, that is witchcraft. That's occultish. We don't want to do that. And so the control, and then, of course, there's unbelief, and, of course, pride. Pride is one of those things that won't allow the Lord. He says, if you're prideful, he'll resist you. That's why he's looking for a humble heart. What's a humble heart? Is to recognize, I have issues. I need to deal with these issues. I cannot live with this, this fear and shame and control in my life. So it's so important to understand, if we've had abandonment, you probably can say, well, yeah, I struggle with anger. I struggle with violence. Or I struggle with pride. And I think we all struggle with pride. Pride is something that we need. We need to really learn how to be humble. Because he was humble. And that, to know, to be humble is to have that connection, that relationship with him. It's a sign of um, you, when you're surrendering, when you're giving your all to him. When you say, I've given my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, that means, is he Lord in your life? Is he Lord in your life? Because like I said, you may know about God, but do you really know him? And I was listening to somebody that said this statement. It was very powerful because he was talking about a function of a father. And as a father, a father is there to provide, to nurture, right? And it's not, not simply a title. It's a function. Because there's fathers that have a, a title, but there's no function. Okay? And it's the same thing saying, yeah, I have a relationship with Jesus, but there's no function. I don't, I don't live the way he's telling me to live, or do I surrender my life to him the way I want to live? We want to live in that title. So if I have a title, I have to live in that, in that title. And, 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 and this is a process, okay? This is not just one, oh, I'm going to, you have to, we need to come into a place of surrender. And when we come to that place of surrender and humble ourselves before him, he will exalt you. He will exalt you. And so sometimes there's things that God is going to deal with our hearts, and it's not going to look good. It's not going to feel good either. But a humble heart is it. That's who he exalts. That's who he looks for. Amen? Okay, and the other uh, shame, fear, control, stronghold is also sexual abuse. So if we, if any way we have, uh, you know, struggle, uh, had sexual abuse or somebody... Uh, touch us inappropriately or anything like that. This is what happens to a person. Maybe you know somebody that you want to help, right? So there's always shame, fear, and control. That is always there, okay? And so what happens? It branches out to victim and passivity. A person that is sexually abused, there's always a victim mentality and a passive mentality. You're not a victim. You're victorious Amen. in Christ, Okay? Uh, what was done with you was injustice, okay? But we're not a victim. We don't stay there. We don't, and then there's that passivity, okay? And there's anger and rage. There's hopeless and helplessness. And there's that bitter and critical heart, okay, that comes. And then there's the fear, which is phobias, okay? If we have phobias. I don't think we ever did a teaching on phobias. Hmm, that's something to teach about. Anyways, that'll be in the future. Uh, Control. There's always pride. And this one is very important. Performance. Performance. You know, we feed on our performance. We feed our identity is based on what we do and not who we are. Our identity is on all our, you know, all the accomplishments that we have. 
But one day, that can go all go. What's left? So our identity is in Him. Okay, it's not what you do. It's not in the doing, it's in the being. That's the beauty of knowing Him, is that when I know who I am, no matter what my accomplishments are, and they all can go and burn and whatever, I'm left with Him, and that's all that matters. That's all that matters. And so we don't want to live in this state. So you might know some people, or maybe you're struggling with some of this, and you can identify with, yeah, I have issues with, with being a victim and being passive. Passivity is a person that's in that comfort, and it's fear. It's all fear, fear-based. And, and that's where the Lord wants to bring healing to our soul. He wants to bring healing to our spirit, because when we're not healed in this area, then we're just in a cycle of patterns in our lives, and they're destructive. And so that's why it's so important to deal with that, because it brings a lot of shame, you know, because we think that we're the only person in the planet that this has happened to. A person that's been through this the abuse, that's how they think, and that's the way they process things. And the way that they heal this is really by, by the Lord. It's the Lord healing, and it's a process. It's a process of healing, deliverance, and the cleansing and knowing who you are, you know. And so I was, I was, um, I was reading my devotional, and there was a, a testimony of a, a young, well, when he was born. Uh, his mom first before before he was born, his mom was married, but had an affair, and in that an affair she got pregnant, and she was still married to the other guy. So. That got divorced. He was born. He never met his biological son. So just look at all this stuff right there. You're looking at uh, this child is born in, uh, in a home that there's no father figure. Okay. And then the mother uh, emotionally unstable. So there's Ill illegitimacy, not only physically, but also spiritually. And then the mother couldn't keep up with him and gave him to the state and went to foster parents, to find his foster parents. And then from there, he got sexually abused within the foster parents. So it was like doom and gloom. Well, now he's a doctor. Okay. So when he grew up, he grew up with all these deficiencies and lack and hurt and pain. So what he did, he had to medicate that. And sometimes we medicate things, right? And started medicating those things with drugs, with alcohol. He was trying to a void in his life and um, as, as uh, he, it, got, it became very destructive until he met Jesus okay now he met Jesus and now he's free from that isn't that a, a beautiful testimony it's a short testimony but it is just how where it looked like there was no purpose no future and God saw that and there was an injustice done to him but God redeemed it See, God redeems all those things, those injustices that have happened to our lives. As he redeems that, he brings new things. You know, he brings us a new cloak, a new name, a new dressing over our lives. No longer shame, no longer fear, no longer control. And that's what he wants to do in our lives. He doesn't want us to be subject to our past. But what is he doing today? What is he, what, and what is the future that he has for us? It's a great future that he has for our lives. So it's so important to understand the importance of getting those areas in our lives um, um, healed and delivered and to recognize the need that we have for a healer. Amen. Okay, so I just want to talk a little bit of an inadequacy, and we're going to go through the, the verses here. Inadequacy, what is inadequacy? Inadequacy is the quality and the state of being inadequate. Insufficiency, deficiency. And I found all these words that come with it, obviously, like other words that the meanings of insufficiency, poverty, incompleteness, restrictedness, um, incapable, inferiority, uselessness, lack of skill. And the word tells us the opposite. Many times we feel this way. That's what inadequacy is poverty mindset. I'm not enough. How many times we said that? I'm not enough. I'll never be enough, no matter how much I do, do, do. And it's not in the doing. It's not in the doing. So 2 uh, Corinthians 9, 8 says, In God, it says, And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always have all sufficiency, 
all sufficiency. Okay? In all things. Isn't the word amazing? Like, if that doesn't speak to you, but many times we don't believe in that. We don't walk in that sufficiency. We're like walking in lack many times. He says, in all things, we have abundance in every good work. You know, and the opposite of um, inadequacy is abundance and surplus. Abundance and surplus. So it says here in Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do what? Exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Wow. Christ in us. You know, the moment that I, I don't, I have to believe in that. I have to believe in that. I have to believe that the power, I got to believe what the word says about me. Who is the one that's in me? Christ. He is all powerful. Amen. And so that's what that power as it works in us, in us individually, we're going to be able to give it to others. And it says in John 10, 10, the thief does not come except to what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy right? I have come that you may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So it's so important that he wants us to live in abundance. He wants us to live in that abundance and love and the things that he wants for our lives. You know, that's what the enemy comes. Shame, fear, and control. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's what shame and fear control does in our life. We tend to outsource and to medicate our lives with things. You know that you can medicate your life with your husband, your wife? That can be your source. They're not your source. Your children are not your source. Okay? Painkillers are not your source. Drugs are not your source. Alcoholism is not your source. And when we navigate, when we go towards those things to heal or to try to find some sort of rest, all you're doing is bringing more chaos. You know, he is your source. He is your source. That's why the power that works in us is Christ. So when I'm outsourcing, I'm looking in the wrong places. And it's a temporary, I would call it temporary fix, you know, to, to what? To numb something that tomorrow it's coming back again. It doesn't go away. But when I give my life to the Lord... And when I give those things to the Lord and repent and surrender, whatever things that I'm outsourcing, he becomes your source. He becomes your living source. Amen? God is so good. Okay. It says, my brethren, count it all for joy. (laughs) When you fall into what? Various trials. I'm here in a trial right now. Woo! Knowing that testing of your faith produces what? Patience. patience. How many of us ask for patience? Don't ask for patience. I tell you, when you ask for patience, guess what's going to happen? Mr. Patience is going to come, and you're going to be tested, and it's not going to feel good. Listen, we're here on earth because, you know, he, he's testing our hearts. He's testing our hearts. He's testing your foundation. He's measuring You know, he said that when I come back, am I going to find faith on the earth? Something to think about. Wow, Lord help us all. (laughs) But let patience have its perfect work. Mm. So he wants to perfect in us, right? He is, we're in progress. We're we're progressing. Okay, this is not something, boom, automated. It's It's a journey. And as we get closer to him, closer to him, it gets better. Yeah. That you may be perfected and complete. And I love this. Lacking nothing. Okay? Inadequacy was that you are lacking. But he doesn't want you lacking in nothing. And when I talk about lack, I'm not talking about money. This is not talking about money. Okay? That's secondary. That's not even. It is lacking what's inside of you. Are you lacking peace? Are you lacking joy? Are you lacking love? Are you lacking in, in, in your relationship with the Lord? Whatever you're lacking, he says, I make it complete and I want to perfect it. But to perfect it, we need to surrender. And when we are in trials and tribulations and we're being tested, it's not for us to run and get offended. 
and blame God because that's the first thing we do. Yeah, where's God in all this? Well, let me tell you something. You're being tested. You know, and it's, and it's not easy when you're going through a test. It's sometimes a time of, of, it hurts, it's painful. But that's why we're part of a community. And as a community, we come together and we're there to help each other. You know, we're interdependent, not dependent. We only dependent on him. Right? I don't, we don't become dependent to each other because that's not healthy. We become interdependent because as we come together, we become dependent to him. And that is where he wants us to be. So the moment that I say, and this is inadequacy, okay? The moment that I say, I can't, I feel inadequate, I'm insecure, I'm minimizing Christ in me. I'm minimizing who he is in me. Okay, I'm going to say that again. The moment I say, I can't, I'm, I feel inadequate, I'm insecure, and you can go on and on and on. There's so many things that we can say. I'm minimizing Christ in me. And you know, we don't want to minimize what he's done because he's done a lot, a lot. And we need to be thankful for the things. That's why in Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Who is the one that strengthens us? Christ. Many times we walk in our self-sufficiency, that I can do this. I'll get, I'll fix this. I can move over. I can do it better than you, God. Just saying. Sometimes we do that. And that's where pride gets in the way. You know, but no. He is the one that strengthens us. When we're going through those testing times, that's where you have to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And as he strengthens you, you know what? The test gets lighter and lighter. And then you say, yes, I passed the test. I made it. And then here comes the other one. <laughs> I was like, oh, man. Well, you know, you just graduated from one, and here goes it. Well, that's how it is. You know, it's how it is. We're on this earth. We're, you know, there's things that are going to come at us, and we need to be aware and be ready. Be ready. You know, and so it's so important to know who you are in Christ. Know that you're seated with him. Right. Seated with him. And how many places? Can you imagine that? Can you see? You have a seat with him? That's what the word says. I'm not making this up. It's what it says in Ephesians. Read Ephesians. And it tells you everything. Ephesians 1 and 2, it tells you everything who you are. You are his beloved. Okay? You are his beloved. You are, it says, receive the spirit of adoption. Yes. It's all about receiving. It's all about partaking. It's an invitation that he does all the time. He's always as you come. He's always saying, I'm knocking at the door. See, he never comes in barging in, okay. No, he doesn't do that. He knocks. He's a gentleman. He comes and knocks. And he says, and if you open the door, I will come in and I will feast with you. I will eat with you. I will dine with you. I want to have relationship with you. See, when I was saying the other, the other Sundays, whenever I say a lot of things, but anyways, uh, I, 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 <laughs> I put a little humor here. Anyways, what was I saying? Now I lost my, yeah, I do say a lot of things. Thank you. We say we have a relationship with Jesus, right? And so we have to have the evidence that we do. The evidence of change. The birthing, being born again. Remember Nicodemus? What happened to Nicodemus? He went in secrecy. Hey, Jesus, come, I need to talk to you about something. Who was Nicodemus? Let's put it this way. He was a man. He was a Bible scholar. He knew all the law. He was well-known. Okay? He knew all the law. Perfect. But he couldn't understand one thing. He said, tell me about this being born again. And then he says, do I have to go back into my mother's womb? <laughs> That's what happens when there's too much, too much writing, too much law, too much of ourselves. Do I have to go back, you know, and be born again? And she said, no. What is the flesh is the flesh, and what is the spirit is the spirit. And we all need to experience the birthing. We all need to experience being born again. Okay, and, and doing that is, the first step is asking him to come in. 
That's what he says, I come knocking. That's what I did many years ago. I walked, I said, come on in. Was it easy? No. Was it trial? I had a lot of trials, a lot of testing, a lot of things I had to confront and, and grow and things to go. And I am where I am because by his grace. It's by his grace. Not because of me. It's by his grace I'm here. And so we need to understand the importance, what Hebrews 12, 2 says. Looking unto Jesus, who? The author and finisher of our faith. Mm. Who for the joy that has set before him endured what? Endured the cross. Despising what? The shame. Wow. And to sit on the right hand. He sat on the right hand of the throne of God. And that's where we're seated with him. Seated with Christ. Amen. Despising shame. He went through a lot. Okay. And uh, let me tell you, when we saw a lot of, we see a lot of movies and we see a lot of pictures of Jesus on the cross and, and we see him, I was reading something about this and the Romans were not that nice, obviously. And so they did not really cover him, his anatomy. They left him hanging everywhere. Okay. There was nothing covered over him because they wanted to make it a display of shame. So he became shameful so you can become whole. That's the beauty. We need to visualize that and grasp the revelation of the understanding that shame was put on him so I can be free. That is the beauty. And he didn't stay on the cross. <laughs> right? He didn't stay there. He's not on there. He's resurrected from the, the crown of what? The thorns? The, the crown of the kingship. Now he's king. And that is... That is the end result of what has been given to us. And so I, just, I, I was reading this, this passage, and it has just brought so much freedom to me. Colossians 2, 11, 15. I really write it down, put it down, read it tonight. Read it until you get it, until it goes deep down into your heart. It says, Colossians 2, 11, 15. In him you were all circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Isn't that beautiful? Do we understand what that means? Back then, they had to circumcise. Carriage, we, all, we don't have to do that anymore because he became. Without, but putting off the body of sin of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Christ became the circumcision. Christ became everything. Buried with him in baptism. Many of us were baptized in the summer. That's what baptism represents. That buried with him in the baptism in which you also were raised with him in faith, working with God. So that's what baptism is, death to life. The old man is buried and the new man begins. That's what baptism is. That's the beauty of knowing. That's the true birthing in our lives. That's part of, you know, the testimony of what he is and what he did for our lives. And it says, who raised him from dead and you, and you, and you, it says, and you, bringing dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh. He said, and it says, he made and has made alive together with him. That's the beauty that we're alive with him. We're, no longer, we're, we're dead in our old ways, but we're alive in him. Having forgiven you all your trespasses having wiped out all the handwriting of all requirements that was against us. Do you know that there was a sentence of death in our lives? If Christ didn't do what he did, we would be all dead. Okay? It says, having wiped all the hand, and it says here, and he has, has taken it out, it says, of the way, nailed it. They nailed him. They nailed it to the cross. Having what? disarmed principalities and powers and made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So this is just, just the last part is like, wow. He became, his crucifixion became a decree and a declaration for us, for us of what he did on the cross. And that disarmed He's disarming shame. He's disarming fear. He's disarming all control in our lives. And all those are principalities. All powers have been removed from our lives. 
But sometimes it doesn't happen that way. Sometimes we're giving power to the enemy. You know, I was listening to a preaching about um, uh, Jeremiah Johnson. He was saying, like, in the beginning, in Adam and Eve, it was a serpent. And when you're reading Revelation, it became a dragon. How did it become a serpent and all of a sudden a dragon? Because we fed it. Yeah. We fed it. We all fed that thing. We feed the enemy. We give it power. It says here that he disarmed it. I have to believe in that, that it's been disarmed, that it's been pulled down, that it's been taken out. He became that decree and that declaration. Redemption. Redemption. He came to redeem us from death. And that's what he came to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, this is it. This is, my, this is what I wanted to teach. I hope this has helped you. It's so important to understand the importance of our, our position in Christ and knowing that he came to disarm those things. If we're going through uh, attacks in our minds, if we're constantly battling with our mind with things, let me tell you something. He came to disarm that. He did that 2,000 years ago. And we need to believe that that is done. But I have to take my responsibility and my action to say, not now and not ever. You're going to come into my life and bring all those accusations. Like um, Denise talked about the spirit of accusation that comes. The enemy loves to bring accusation. He loves to fill us with lies. And that's why it's so important to live a life in, that, in a sense of abundance, of wholeness, and knowing that there's no lacking in him. Okay, and if you're lacking, if you're lacking in love, if you're lacking in joy, allow him to be your joy. Amen. Why don't we all stand and let's pray. I just want to thank those who are watching on Facebook. And I just pray that the Lord will fill you, nurture you, and reveal his heart to you and the things that he has for your life. Amen.